Father in heaven, we thank you this morning that we can be here before you and honor you in our words and in our praise for what you've done for us on the cross. We thank you and praise you, Lord Jesus. Be with us now as we receive a message from you through Pastor Phil, and we just ask your blessing on it. May it touch our hearts and guide our, our mind and our, our lives this week. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. What's the, uh, what's the coldest time you've experienced in your life? I'm sitting here thinking as I'm watching TV over the last couple of days and they're talking about this terrible, terrible forecast for tomorrow. I'm thinking, well, I've seen worse than this, I think. So what's the coldest you've ever seen? Now, I know, I know not, not all of you experienced the storm of uh, 1908 like Galen did. So, uh, you know, just had to, where's Galen? There, I had to get you. I did, some, I did some research yesterday to find out when the big storms were. So, but I know there have been worse storms than, than the cold that we're facing now. What's the coldest you've ever faced? 41 below in Long Prairie in 1980s. 60 below at Camp Ripley in 1996. Yeah, 95, 96 were banner years. So, well, you're all brave souls to be out this morning. I told the elders this morning, I'm going to preach. I'm going to preach what's on my heart, whether there's 10 people or 100 here. So uh, get ready, because I'm going to give you both barrels. And uh, I'm excited about what I'm going to share with you this morning. You know, a lot of times, I told you a couple weeks ago, there's times when I agonize over sermons. And it just seems like it's never going to come together. But I took off between Christmas and New Year's just to be with family because we had family around and came in the office on Thursday. Actually, before I came in the office, I got out my uh, devotional book by Oswald Chambers, read the, uh, I think it was the January 1 that I read on, on Thursday. And uh, the word surrender stuck out to me. And I laid there on the couch praying and meditating, and within about a 20-minute period, I had my sermon just like that. Now, it took a while to put it all together and put it on paper and all that kind of stuff, but it's one of those things I was intending to preach on something else, and God just kind of whammed me with this one. And uh, so I'm anxious to share it with you this morning. But before I do, I want to let you know that I'm responding to a suggestion that somebody gave me. I think the elders gave it to me uh, a, a few months ago. And that was the possibility of putting out a box and giving you the opportunity to share suggestions of what you would like me to preach on. So I did that. It's on the coffee table. And it's not, you know, don't, don't try to do it on a big eight and a half by 11 sheet, just a small little sheet, maybe a text or a topic that you want me to preach on. Uh, you know, don't, uh, don't tell me to preach on how can I get my husband to stop beating on me or something like that, you know, but, but something that's relevant, you know, and uh, let's, just, let's just talk about those kinds of things because I want to share with you things that are on your heart and uh, we'll do that. So you can either drop it in the box over the next two, three weeks, or you can uh, email it to me at pastorphilr at msn.com. And uh, sometime this year, I'll do whatever I can to, uh, to preach on that. Now, don't ask for a 10-week series. Don't ask me to do Revelation again. Um, but uh, you ask me what's on your heart, and I'd love to, to do what I can to, to do that. Well, normally, um, we give the word surrender, which is the word that really caught my mind and my heart when I was reading through Oswald Chamber. Nor normally, we think of surrender as a negative word. Uh, we think of things like raising a white flag or the loss of a battle or the loss of control or some kind of humiliation or some kind of embarrassment. 
But surrender is a huge idea, a huge theme in the Bible. It's not that the word surrender itself is used all that much. It's never used in the New Testament. At least in the NIV it isn't. It's used, I think, only 17 times in the Old Testament. And usually those have kind of a a negative connotation of an army surrendering to Israel or Israel having surrendered to some other kind of uh, army. But it is, it is a big idea that comes out in Scripture, and if you read the devotional writers, you will always run across the word surrender or submission. And so that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. There are notes in your bulletin. I'd encourage you to take it out because there's a couple of blank spaces for you to fill in. And it might just kind of help you stay on track with me. There are some of the verses that I'm going to share this morning uh, with you. But we're going to talk about surrender today and then, not next week, but the following, because next week is, uh, is Youth Sunday. But the following Sunday after that, I'm going to preach on Philippians 1.6, which talks about being confident of this very, th- good, very, this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. It's sort of a companion text with what I'm going to be sharing this morning. But first of all, let me just say that surrender is active, not passive. Surrender is active, not passive. God is not calling us to be spiritual couch potatoes. This is not asking God to drop everything in our laps or to do everything for us. Um, it's, it's not It's not passive, it's active. And Jesus is our supreme example when in the Garden of Gethsemane, he kneels down and he says to the Father, not my will, but yours be done. It's very active. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2 says this, Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. What Jesus did for you and me was submission, it was surrender, but it was very active. He gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering to God. Let's read this other text from John chapter 10, verses 14 through 18. And I'd like you to have, like to have you read it along with me and notice the italicized phrases as we go through this, okay? Let's read it. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. Now that is active surrender. I lay it down of my own accord. I give it to the Father. I make my own desires and my own will subservient to what the Father wants me to do. I lay down my life for the Father. Abraham modeled surrender. You remember in Genesis chapter 12, God calls Abraham to take his family and to move to a place that he's going to show him. He doesn't really give many ideas to where it's going to be. He just says, go, and I will make of you a great nation. And so Abraham picks up stakes. Can you imagine what that was like? How many of you have lived in the same place your entire life? Maybe the same house. Okay, you guys, young guys there. How many of you have lived in the same town your whole life? Um, If you haven't moved... Uh, you don't know what this is all about. If you've moved from one town to another, or if you've been in the kind of vocation like we are, or you've moved several times, you know what it is to pull up stakes. You know what it is to go to a new town where you meet new people who you've never seen before. I remember the first time we did it, we were in Danville, Illinois, a town of about 45,000, kind of an agricultural, a big agricultural town. And I remember after having been there seven and a half years, it was like 
there was like a sheet that came down in front of the windshield of, uh, of a car, and I had, I had no idea where we were going from there. And I got some calls and did some inquiry myself and, and through a series of events was called to Blairsburg, Iowa. But both, both Mary Ellen and I remember that occasion probably more than any other of what it felt like to pull up our roots. Some of you know what that feels like. It's really unsettling. And that's what God asked Abraham to do. And then, when his son was somewhere, we don't know exactly how old, if you watch the, the film, uh, the series on TV, the Bible, which they're going to be airing again, they, they do a really good job of showing Abraham offering his son Isaac as a sacrifice to God, and God steps in and pulls in a ram out of a thicket, and he's a substitute sacrifice. But... For, for, for Abraham to take his one and only son, Isaac, his true son, through whom he would be the progenitor of a great race of people that would be as many as the stars of the sky and the sand of the seashore, and for Abraham to take God's promise to him through Isaac and offer Isaac as a sacrifice, fully intending to take his life, which just was unthinkable. Some people have called it the death of a vision, where you think you know what God wants you to do, and then all of a sudden you come to the realization that that is not going to come true, at least for several years. And for Abraham to just take his son and give him willingly to the Lord to surrender his son, to surrender his dreams that God has given him. The author of Hebrews picks it up and says, By faith Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises, that's Abraham, was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Jesus called his disciples to surrender Deny me, take up your cross, and follow me. I remember the first time that, that I did that. <clears throat> I've done it many times since. It was years after my conversion. But I remember a chapel service at St. Paul Bible College when it had that name. And I remember the speaker talking about this kind of thing. And I remember as the altar call was given, uh, going up to the altar, and there were many of us that were on the platform kneeling, and I remember sort of mentally building an altar in front of me and laying on that altar myself and my ambitions and my thoughts and my dreams and just, you know, whatever I had to lay on the altar then. Since then, there's been a lot of other things that I've had to lay on the altar, like my wife and my children and my ministry and my, you know, and just saying, God, it's, it's yours. It's, it's yours. Surrender is the path to holiness. Surrender is the path to holiness. Put another way, holiness is a byproduct of surrender. Let me play with your brain just a little bit here. Hope you can follow what I'm thinking. But there's some people who pursue happiness. They just want happiness more than anything else in the world. That's what they really pursue. And so they want all of the stars to align and all of the circumstances of life to align in such a way that they get happiness because happiness is the goal of their life. And if you've lived long enough, you have discovered the fact that happiness is not something that you can actually grasp. It is a byproduct of the way you live. Happiness is a byproduct of living the right way, doing the right thing, knowing God, And I think holiness is kind of like that. 
I don't think holiness is something that you pursue just for holiness sake. I think holiness is a byproduct of your surrendering your life wholly, completely to God. I think if you just pursue holiness as something in itself to pursue, that you get in the, you get in the rut of legalism or of measuring up. The holiness movement in the early stages of the 19th or the 20th century really was characterized by, in some circles, like in Wesleyan circles, for example, in some Wesleyan Methodist circles, women would not wear diamonds. Uh, they wouldn't have engagement rings with a diamond on it because it was too gaudy. Or holiness can be kind of artificial, like certain places in the United States back when I was growing up, you couldn't go to a bowling alley because at bowling alleys there was tobacco and there was liquor and you just couldn't come close to that kind of thing. So if you just pursue holiness as holiness, you tend to get into this kind of pharisaical thing where you're just you're just wanting to be sure you do the right thing at the right time all the time, and it becomes a, just a list, a category of do's and don'ts. But holiness is a byproduct of following Jesus. Holiness is a byproduct of denying yourself, taking up your cross, and following Jesus. Surrender is active, not passive. Secondly, surrender is for our good and not our harm. Surrender is the path to fulfillment. Now, when I say the path to fulfillment, I'm not saying the path to this kind of self-actualization and self-fulfillment and self-this and self-that. What I am saying is that surrender is the path to the fulfillment of all that God wants you to be. Some of you in this room, and I look out and I see some of our college students and high school students, and I can remember when I was going through that time frame myself a long time ago, and worrying about now what am I going to do and what am I going to be and where am I going to be, Am I going to be a pastor? Am I going to be a missionary? Am I going to be a trumpet player in an orchestra? Am I going to whatever, you know? And where am I going to do this? And I came to the discovery that a calling has more to do with the person you follow than it does with the profession or the place that you minister. And uh, surrender is for our good. It is for our fulfillment in doing all that God wants us to be. Got another verse, very familiar. I want you to read along with me. It's from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And let's just read it together. I think it's up on the screen. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Notice, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice to God. And then he ends up by saying, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Surrender is the path to fulfillment. Notice those words. His will for you is good, pleasing, and perfect. I got a letter just the other day from, from a couple missionaries who we know through... Um, through Heidi and Dale being at the Alliance Theological Seminary, and these uh, missionaries are now serving in Jordan. They've been home in the States for a year of home service, and they just went back to Jordan. 
The letter told about how they got their stuff settled and how they hung up their pictures and put out their Christmas stuff in their apartment. And there was a line that struck me as I was reading through that letter when, when one of them looked at the other. She said, it, it feels so good to be home. Home. And I thought to myself, some people have the idea that if God calls you, that, that if you surrender to God, he's going to call you to be a missionary in, in some dark place on the other side of the world, and that you're just going to be miserable, and that God is out to make you miserable. And I would just simply say that if God calls you where he takes you, he will provide for you, he will care for you. There will be difficult times there, just like there are difficult times here. But wherever you go, if you go with him, he will care for you, and he will love you as much as he loves you now, even more. And he does it for your good, not for your harm. I want to talk to moms and dads. Uh, Other than, uh, help me with their names, the missionaries that have gone out from this church, they're overseas. Hostetters. Uh, other than them, I think, uh, Russ, your daughter has been overseas. But God just kind of laid it on my heart through reading an article this last week that I, I, th- I think there's got to be somebody in this congregation who's of an age that can start looking towards that kind of thing that God's going to call to be a pastor. Do you know that the Do you know that the volume, the number of young pastors is dwindling? Not just in mainline denominations, but in in evangelical denominations. And we have fewer missionaries in the Alliance than we've ever had. I can remember growing up as a boy and they're boasting that there were 1,200 missionaries on the field. We have less than 800. Some of that is due to finances. But but I just, not that being a missionary or being a pastor is the highest calling in the world, but, man, somebody's got to feel God calling them to do something like that. So God puts you in a place and puts you in a position, but... The, the most important thing is that you're surrendered to him. Because his will primarily concerns your being surrendered to a person. And that's the, that's the bottom line thing. Position and place are, they're important, but they're incidental to your being devoted to him. He's out for your good. The Lord's Prayer is a a model of this whole idea of being totally surrendered to the Lord. The Lord's Prayer starts out with adoration of, of God, with a declaration of his greatness. Say the first couple of phrases with me of the Lord's Prayer, okay? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Next, it moves to our allegiance to the one whose greatness we have just proclaimed. And the next part goes, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. I don't care whether you're training to be a pastor or a missionary or an architect or a doctor or a teacher or a homemaker or you can name them all. There there ought to be some compelling sense in your life that that is the gift that God has given you and you want to do that job or that position to the best of your ability to honor and to glorify God. Amen? Amen? I mean, if that's not what you're living for, then you ain't living for much. If you're just living to make money or living to, to be happy, um, 
Rick Warren puts it this way. He says, your wisest moments will be those when you say yes to God. Lastly, surrender brings victory, not defeat. I want you to take your Bible and turn to Exodus chapter 20. If you've got a Bible, please use it. Please bring it. I'm not going to be printing the text for you over the next year like I did with Revelation, so please bring your Bible. Exodus 20. And I'm going to take the time to read the first 14 verses. Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 14. Surrender brings victory, not defeat. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp near pi hi between Migdal and the sea, there to encamp by the sea, directly opposite to Baal Zephon. Pharaoh will think, The Israelites are wandering around the land in confusion, hemmed in by the desert. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. But I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites did this. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds about them and said, What have we done? We've let the Israelites go and have lost their services. So he had his chariots, chariot made ready and took his army with him. He took 600 of the best chariots along with all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, so that he pursued the Israelites who were marching out boldly. The Egyptians, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops, pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped by the sea near Pi-Hiroth, opposite Baal Zephon. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Was it because there was no graves in Egypt that you brought us out in the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Say that last verse with me, will you? The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Some of you are thinking, now that sounds like passive submission. No, it's very active submission. It's very active surrender. Some of the hardest things you you and I have to do as humans is to surrender to the Lord. One of the most difficult things you and I have to do is to trust God. We have so much technology and so much advance and so many privileges and so many benefits and so many possessions that it is the hardest thing in the world for you and me to trust God. You say, surrender what? Self. Agenda. Ambitions. Personality. Possessions. Spouse. Children. Let them follow God's call 
not yours. I've ministered almost all of my career in agricultural or near agricultural areas. And I found that one of the most difficult areas of profession are either when a person is raised in a family that farms or a person is raised in a family that owns a business and dad or mom expect them to carry on the business. I read, a, I read something by uh, Joyce Meyer, just a quote from her this week that just, just tickled me. She says, go home and let all your relatives off the potter's wheel. You are not the potter. I like that. L- let me say something. Let me say something that I want you to take the right way. It, it is... One of the most difficult things for us to do is to to take our hands off of our children. There's there's the temptation. Annabelle, can I borrow you for a minute? Just turn around, let me hold your shoulders, okay? There is the temptation when our children grow up to take them in our arms. (laughs) You're a little bit bigger than a baby. and to do everything for them. And then once they walk, we're just so excited about it, but we, we, we guide them. We do, and it's, it's part of our job. And I would say, and here's where I, I don't want to get in trouble because I really, I really love homeschooling. We did it for, for our own kids, and I, I think it's a great thing. But the, the more exposure you have to your kids throughout their growing up years, the, the more difficult it can become to let go. And the problem with some of us, whether we homeschool or don't homeschool, is that we want to be so sure that our kids make exactly the right turns and the right moves that we just never let them decide for themselves. And, and one of the ways we do that is by saying, oh, now, don't, don't do that, that's bad. And don't do that, that's bad. And don't do this, that's bad. And, and those things we need to say along the line, but to be, to be the kind of parent God wants you to be, there has to come a time when you kind of start during their early years to just encourage them and help them make some decisions on their own because ultimately what you want for them in life is not for them just to follow the way mommy and daddy live but to know what it is to have the Holy Spirit in their heart so that they can begin to walk alone. You follow me? It's hard for us. It, it's not, I mean, sometimes you want to cling to your kids and you want to make the decisions for them and you want to, sometimes when they get to be 19 and 20 years old and 23 and 24, you're still in that, you're still in that steering mode and it's, it's really hard. It's really hard to back off and trust God. We've gone through that. And we're still going through that. We still are. There's some, this whole business of putting everything on the altar is not something that you do one time and forget about it. It's through the progression of your life as a, as a parent and then a grandparent and whatever. You just, it's hard. But that's what it means to follow Jesus. And please understand that I'm not pointing at anybody. I'm pointing at me. Because I've had... I've had conversations with my own boys where basically they've told me, Dad, you kind of, you know... You didn't back off soon enough. But 
Backing off doesn't mean you just leave and go to the wind. Backing off means you pray like crazy. With one of our boys going through some really tough emotional times, just tears your heart. But you've got to give them to God. You've got to give them to God. Because let me tell you, the path to confidence is surrender. The path to peace is surrender. Last Sunday, because we were gone on vacation, we went up to a Lincoln Free Church, and they have an interim pastor there, and he told a story about his mom, who was in her 90s, and who's been very, uh, he used a word, I don't know what it was, uh, the, another word would be controlling, I guess, just having to have all her ducks in a row, and she's just, she's got to the point where she just can't do it anymore, but um, the interim pastor said that his sister saw her mom one day, and she was, her mom was just kind of laying out over the, the kitchen table in her apartment, uh, independent living, whatever it was, with all of her pills spread out. And she was trying to figure this all out and just couldn't do it and was just getting more and more frustrated and furious the whole time. And her, her daughter, this pastor's sister, said to her mom, Mom, you just need to learn to trust us. Wasn't easy, but there came a point in that conversation where mom finally just surrendered. And, and this pastor said that whether it was later on that day or the next day, he, he, his sister saw his mom with her walking cart, you know. She was going along. The old gray mare, she ain't what she used to be, ain't what she used to be. It's just, just great. Surrender is the path to peace. Let me read you one last quote from Dietrich Bonhoeffer in The Cost of Discipleship, one of the greatest books on discipleship that's ever been written. No one should be surprised at the difficulty of faith if there is some part of his life where he is consciously resisting or disobeying the commandment of Jesus. Is there some part of your life which you were refusing to surrender at his behest? Some sinful passion, maybe, or some animosity, some hope, perhaps your ambition or your reason. How can you hope to enter into communion with him when at some point in your life, you were running away from him. I surrender all. I want you to close your eyes. And if you are able and willing, I would like you to kneel at the chair where you're sitting. If you can't do it, I understand. If you won't do it, I understand but I would like you to kneel, and I'll kneel. And I can't, uh, I can't by any means control what you do from this point on. This may seem like a very weird exercise to you, and you may totally reject it, but I would, I would encourage you to just mentally and emotionally build, build an altar out of that chair that you kneel in front of or just right in front of you. And, and think about Abraham giving up his son and God the Father giving up his son and God the Son giving up his own will. And I would like you to put some things on that altar. I think this is a great time to do it. You'll have to do it hundreds of times in the future. You may have to do it again tomorrow. I'm 
but in your mind and in your heart, just have a conversation with God about those things that are on that altar. And just say, Lord Jesus, to the best of my ability, I give you And don't hold anything back, please. Lord, you've given me the uh, you've given me the rare privilege of uh, of being a pastor to this people, and I just love them. I was thinking about it yesterday as I was helping Mary Ellen get ready for uh, something that was going to take place at our house, and you just uh, you just kind of flooded me with uh, with love for this congregation and for the tremendous opportunity and privilege you've given me of being their pastor. I'm forever grateful to you, and. Uh, I, I love them, and I'm concerned about them. And I pray that as they, each one of them individually, think through the things that they have placed on that altar, that you would give them the courage and the will and the desire to honestly turn those things over to you. Bless them as they do, Lord. Bless me as I do. Father, hear our prayers. Give us the courage and the ability to trust and to live lives of absolute surrender and spiritual abandon to you. Save us from being mediocre Christians. And help us to be Christians who give you everything we got and everything we are. I pray for young adults in this room who are in college and who are making crucial decisions for their future. Help them to keep you as a person front and center. Help children in this room who are just in the very beginning stages of, of uh, learning about you and learning what it means to trust you. Help them to make the right choices. Help us as parents to help them to learn what it means to be guided by your spirit and not always by our hand. And help us as parents to walk with you. We love you, Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's sing this last song. If you want to stay kneeling, you can. If you want to stand, you can. But let's just uh, sing it to the Lord.
all to Jesus I surrender all to him I freely give I will ever love and trust him in his presence day on the next first ladies all to Jesus opportunity to share with each other. You can get around to a lot of people out there. There will not be Sunday school. It's not that unusual for us to take two Sundays off of Sunday school over the holidays. And uh, so that's what we're doing. And uh, please uh, help yourself to the coffee and talk with each other. Thank you, Annabelle. And by the way, Alan and Bonnie are here. So... <clears throat> so... Fellowship with each other.